Hello everyone, welcome back, hopefully, or welcome to, if this is the first episode you're listening to, we picked a good one. We're covering Nine Man with probably the two most qualified people to speak about it. I'm about joined with uh, Edmund Chan and Jenny Huey, who are basically in charge of running the major. So we're going to get into all the details, we're going to talk some Nine Man history, but uh, welcome to the show, thanks for doing this guys. Thanks Thank very much Josh, it's a pleasure to be here talking to you. Yeah, so Wesley Kwong was on the show, and he kind of set the table for Nine Man, but I, I feel like we need to take a step further for people who do logistics planning, every every little thing we do here. So let's let's talk about the major first of all. Uh, what are we in store for this weekend? How many courts? How many teams? What's what's going on? I feel like it's a record year, I think I read on somebody's Instagram. So let's, let's take it away. How many courts first of all? Uh, this is another record year. Every year it seems to be breaking the previous year's number. Uh, we are at 80 men's teams this year. We're at 79 women's teams this year. Uh, we have 16 courts for each, so it's a total of 32 courts. We're taking up all the huge major halls at the Metro Toronto Convention Center for the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And we expect nothing else uh, but the best of uh, what Nine Man has to offer. Yeah, really. we uh, kind of lucked out on getting this location, actually. We had Fan Expo yeah. that we were competing against, and... Thank goodness they took the weekend before us, and we ended up getting the Labor Day weekend. Yeah, and, and the Metro Tor Toronto Convention Center has been awesome to us. I mean, they've been first-class people all the way, and just us being here in Toronto, being able to showcase our city downtown uh, is awesome. Uh, people really are in for a treat just to be in Toronto and just to be at this tournament, I think. I mean, they don't know how good they have it. We don't even know how good we have it here in Toronto, to be honest. Good, so set the scene for us. The reason we call it the major, right? It's because it's not nationals because it's North America, right? Like, um, can you kind of just list where some teams are coming from? Like, it's pretty spread out throughout Canada and, and the United States, it, right? Exactly. It's funny because all the American teams, I wouldn't say all of them, but the majority of them actually call it nationals. Right? Okay. Yeah. So I don't know whether it's a USA kind of thing, but uh, we don't call it nationals we call here. It like, we, we call, call it, it Labor Day. Yeah, we call it Labor Day tournament. Right. Yeah. Which, I mean, is like a pretty consistent holiday across North America. Yeah. And it feels kind of odd to say nationals because it truly is like a North American. Right. Sport. Well, it is. And you're right. exactly right, Josh, by saying that. But uh, this is the, let's say, North American championships um, and uh, nationals, if you want to call it. This is the... Uh, the ultimate sort of uh, end of season uh, championship tournament for both uh, men's and women's uh, teams that wraps up the season. So this is our Super Bowl. This is our Stanley Cup playoffs. This is our Masters. This is our Wimbledon. This is all those things happening this weekend. And let's let's go over the format. How do you schedule an eighty team or seventy nine team schedule? Just for our, our listeners who might not be familiar, uh, pools of five on the first day. It will be pools of five. It's actually relatively easy in this kind of schedule. We were very fortunate to have the right number of teams or almost the right number of teams to actually make the schedule work. We're going to have 16 courts. It'll be five, uh, 16 pools of five. Uh, and uh, we'll do a round robin on day one. We'll do power pools on day two with a similar sort of setup of pool play again. And Monday, day three, is always playoffs. And um, men's features uh, single elimination bracket playoffs. Uh, for the tiered divisions that we'll have. But the women's game has a double elimination format for the gold flight um, division. So that's always a treat for me, actually, because I don't get to see that in any other volleyball competition. Uh, I'm sure it happens in beach, where you've got a loser's bracket, but uh, I don't watch that closely enough as I do our women's game. So it's always uh, kind of a, a surprise to me how it plays out, and it's actually quite exciting for me as a spectator. And I don't get to say that I get to be a spectator often, actually. So, Jenny, what do you... The, I mean, you played in the double elimination bracket. Like, what was it like as you to you as a player? It's harsh. I mean, you... Like, grueling harsh? Oh, grueling. It's, it's tiring. It's, like, it's an incentive for you not to lose. Right. Because you're literally climbing and fighting and clawing your way back up to the top because you have to play those extra matches and obviously there's advantage if you're well rested um but it does add that that dramatic sort of flair right to it especially when you get to the finals and you're playing against a team who's been undefeated um you know uh, I, I feel like i feel like the crowd because you know i used to be a player i feel like the crowd sort of like roots for that underdog right. who sort of like made it all the way from like 
the lower bracket to fight their way back up to the top, but it actually does make it real exciting. It's just it's exhausting right. when you lose. And do you hold the double limb? Like, if you get to the final with the undefeated team, do you have to beat them twice, or is it just single once the final hits? It, it actually depends. <laughs> it depends. So I, I think for, for this particular weekend, we're holding it inside. So we have the benefit of having, um, you know, three halls that we're playing in. We're not subject to outdoor conditions there's no restriction with sunlight and so um you know here we we can probably play a more thorough final but i think in traditional um tournaments that we played outside if the sun's going down and there's a final whoever wins that first match is basically the winner of the entire tournament so when the sun sets that's it so uh yeah unfortunately sometimes our tournament is dictated by the conditions (laughs) and uh sometimes matches have to get cut short um, and uh, there's elements that we have to guard against and there's time constraints we have to guard against so unfortunately sometimes the double, the double elimination final means just one final but recent years if both teams end up losing so there's only two teams mm-hmm. left right so let's say the team that works its way back up mm-hmm. beats that team that hasn't lost yet so they're, they're currently one loss each. There'll be a one set game to determine the champion. The ch- the champion. That's how it's yep. been the last couple of years. Before mm-hmm. it wasn't like that. Before it was like if the person came up and beat that team, you that would have been it. And right, whereas like you'd always have to beat them three times, kind of, or three games. So I should say yeah, for, for the person, or for, sorry, for the team who's working their way back up from the bottom. Yeah. So it hasn't been consistent. But uh, I think we're actually, at least we've tried to, at least for the last two years, we've tried to uh, bring an element of consistency to the right. final and the path. And uh, hopefully it works, and hopefully no one will uh, be complaining too much about it. But uh, we feel we got something good. It worked out great, great last year, I thought. Uh, I could be biased here, but it worked out great. No, um, the right team won, and so you don't want uh, other influences uh, determining that. Right. So let's let's get into some of these communities. And, I feel sorry, like and I are. and I want to say like Jenny's uh, Jenny has been uh, on uh, uh, the Flying Tigers championship teams in the late nineties, uh, mid nineties, and uh, Jenny has it's been too one, long, yeah. yeah, Jenny has <laughs> been one of the best setters in this tournament. Uh, like she, uh, we're being a little bit humble here. So I don't maybe, have to be humble. Maybe here, but, maybe according to to Edmund. Only, right. But. So yeah, she, and I'm not just saying that because she's my partner in crime, but she was led one of the best teams in this tournament that uh, had its heyday. In so congratulations well, I, I to you. I can say the it. same for you too. Mm, mine was a little bit, a little. Uh, no, 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 no. no. I, I, I wasn't a major player in mine, yeah. but uh, I did. But if you were just make withdrawing it, each other, yeah, I was able. Yeah. I was able to. I had right. fortunate uh, success to be on uh, some of the 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 uh, Linganlem championship teams during the eighties. And uh, this is too bad that my partner in crime, Dallas Keith, couldn't join us right. because <laughs> Dallas gets annoyed every time he asks somebody who their favorite player is, and they don't say themselves. So right. I'm glad that we really? got the segue there. <laughs> You guys got to at least pump each other's tires if you're not uh, going to do it yourself. Okay. Or, yeah, we always ask them like if they're playing pro, who the, like the the best players that they've seen. And Dallas always gets a little upset. He's like, you got to name yourself first, and then you can start complimenting. Do right. they really so. say themselves? No, first? no one has, and Dallas oh, no? wants them okay. to. So, uh, okay, okay. Kind of a yeah. running thing on the show for yeah. any okay, friends so, of the show. Sorry, but, Dallas, it's uh, another no go on that. One. Anyways, um, <laughs> let's talk some of these communities who come to the major every year. And I, and I at the risk of leaving people out because there's 80 teams here. I feel like we have to start on the West Coast just because the men have a bit of a dynasty going and the women have won two in a row or three in a row. So uh, right now, the uh, number one teams coming off last year's tournament in Montreal on the men's side is San Francisco Smash. Uh, they have won, I think, three of the last five or something like that. I'd have to look uh, if I am uh, uh, not have a good memory on that one. Uh, but uh, they've been one of the dominant teams in the last few years for sure. Last year, the team that won is called LA Racky. They are not here this year, but the previous year they were called LA Green. So they are all okay. the last. They're the, the the champions from the past two years. I think the team before that was a San Francisco based team. I think it was Josanna's team, yeah. Team Lung. I'm, yeah, I can't really remember. But um, the last few years has been um, uh, a West Coast sort of. Uh, um, winning side, I suppose, from both men's and women's. And with us being in Toronto, uh, again, not to put you on the spot, if, if we get it wrong, we get it wrong, we'll just get our intern to check it later. Right. But how many clubs are in the GTA right now? I feel like there's seven, eight, like I feel like there, there's a bunch. Organizations? Right? Yes. How many How many organizations would enter like a team or multiple? Like Nung Lum would have 
what do we got this weekend? Four? Five? Uh, eight. We eight? Have, eight? Uh, so eight? Or seven or eight? Lund Lamb Volleyball yeah. is the association that I'm uh, uh, with. Uh, we have uh, eight teams in the men's draw. Oh, Four eight. of them are of the youth variety, and uh, we have an alumni team this year participating, and we have three men's teams, and uh, we're the biggest, uh, as far as numbers, men's organization on the circuit. We're kind of proud to actually say that. Uh, but uh, there's uh, uh, there's several clubs in Toronto. Some are female only, uh, and some are men only. Um, and uh, I, it's more than double digits, I, I would think, as far mm -hmm. as organizations is concerned. Uh, I, I'm just guessing. Maybe not more than 15, but more than 10. I could be wrong, mm -hmm. but uh, I think in those relative numbers, those are the GTA teams. Yeah, you, I mean, you have your you have your clubs, your one-off clubs that. Um, maybe have one or two teams that they field per year. Um, and then you have the more stable clubs like Edmonds, Mum Mum Club, obviously there's yeah, the Flying, Flying Tigers, Tigers as yeah. well, there's Toronto Connex, there's uh, Phoenix and some of the sort of newer upshoots like Legacy, yeah. right? Warriors Lotus. has been around yeah, for a couple of years actually. Um, Zen Chi, Zen Chi uh, still around. As well. Oh my God, I hope I'm not missing There's anybody. Not, we'll get, uh, we'll United get is a new intern yeah. to, to check <laughs> United, Toronto United, United is a new team. Um, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot yeah. of people playing volleyball in the GTA. Every there is summer. a lot Everybody of people like, playing volleyball. There's a lot of kids playing volleyball. Yeah. OVA. I mean, we've done. Uh, I think West Side. West Side. West Side is, a new, is a is a new club that started um, up from uh, Mississauga right. as well. So six pack, just, lost and confused. There's lots of uh, bats. Team, yeah, bats. There's, there's right. Of um, and uh, there has been a boom in, in volleyball in the province of Ontario. You know very well, Josh. You're f totally familiar with the club scene here. Uh, uh, the numbers of uh, female athletes mm. that play in the OVA is, is grown exponentially really? year after year. Uh, there's not as many um, boys participating compared to girls in the OVA, but even that, the numbers of, uh, of, of boys playing mm -hmm. now as opposed to 10, 15 years ago, I mean, it's it's not even close. I mean, the numbers have just grown. So you mean like it's higher? Yeah, it's, right? it's, it's way, uh, there's a lot more people playing volleyball and there's a whole bunch of factors that could probably be a different program to talk about, but uh, there's... Lots of people are playing volleyball, right? Well, like when we when we take a look back at you know the tournament that we held in in two thousand five, right. right? So that's two two cycles ago. If you think about sort of like the the six or seven cities. Do you remember how many teams? Cycle, we yeah. had eighty. In total. Eighty in yeah. two thousand and five. Right. So we're literally double in just under. 15 you know, Kui years. actually pulled up the numbers for the tournament in two thousand and twelve. Right, yeah. where we had one hundred and four. So a hundred back then was the magical barrier that, yeah. I mean, we were the, the psychological first of, barrier. Yeah. Yeah, we broke that psychological barrier. I didn't. Yeah. No, no. We, no, no, no. I think we did. I, I thought we had. A we hundred. broke the entry fee psychological barrier. I remember that. I think we were the first one to charge over a thousand dollars for the tournament. That I remember. As yeah, far we as we were definitely the being the first to tournament to get yeah. over a hundred teams, I can't remember that, but mm -hmm. I'm for sure we broke the financial barrier on mm -hmm. that, even though it was Canadian dollars and. It was 1.4 at the time, I think. But mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned yeah. the, just the growth of volleyball in general. Is there anything contributing directly to Nine Man to say why it's doubled in two cycles? Like, is it just more kids who play club all of a sudden get recruited, or they they find out about Nine Man? Like, what is what is causing this boom? And it's not um, just Toronto. Toronto's a big center, obviously, and, and that it is in Toronto, like that could contribute to the numbers. But it feels like Vancouver's got a boom happening where they they've joined the circuit. Yeah. Uh, there's tons of cities around the U.S. Calgary, uh, Calgary actually has a team. Uh, Ottawa's Ottawa. newer in, in Ottawa's Canada. Newer. Chicago's come back on Chicago's the scene. come back on the scene. LA 14 years ago or 15 years ago. Right. Didn't have that big of a presence. No. So what's causing this boom in this? It, it's a great sport, and we'll get into the rules in it on the modification stuff, but it's fascinating to me that it's growing this much, and it's a sport that's 100% user fees, right? Like, there's uh, no prize money on correct. the line. There, like there's sponsorship is, I wouldn't say at a minimum, but that's not one of the main reasons that makes or breaks this tournament from a financial standpoint. Uh, obviously, we're, we'll welcome any money that comes our way or any interest from any businesses that are willing to be, uh, put their name to, to us. Uh, we have no qualms about that, but it is 100% or almost 100% user-driven fees. We are, we're self-supportive or supporting a self-sustaining uh, operation. Uh, I, I'm actually quite proud that we're able to do that, at least to, to make this tournament a go. But um, and everyone is accepting of that too, though, right? No one is, uh, well, we won't play unless you guys give us money. It, it's never been 
that kind of uh, attitude around it. Uh, everybody wants to participate. Everyone's more than willing to pay their share as long as it's fun. And um, and we've been uh, since Jenny and I actually run the local Toronto tournaments. Um, we've been pretty accepting and inviting to we always try to or never say no we always try to let teams come into play we're, we're, we're we never ever cap uh against lots of people's wishes um and we just want people to play i mean we want people to be involved uh, it pains me anyways to say no to have to say no to someone um, because it could change their life right so for me to say no to a team of maybe 13 year olds to say no just because you're young and you I mean I could turn them off the sport in what with one word and with one fell swoop and I'm not prepared to actually do that I mean I'm here to grow this game Jenny's here to grow this game we're trying to reach this to the masses I mean if I mean we're not trying to black out this is like the CFL does it I mean if your listeners don't even know what that is but um <laughs> but uh you know if you look at the hockey model, I mean, the Winnipeg Jets for, for the longest time were in the just couldn't even get a professional franchise, and and uh, we're not like that. We want to grow. We don't want to take teams away. Now that we have Calgary and Vancouver here, we want them to flourish. We don't want to cut them out. We don't want to say no to them. And, you know, we're not about that. We're trying to grow here. We're trying to make uh, uh, this affordable. We're trying to make uh, uh, people understand and enjoy and have a sense of belonging to a, something that's just bigger than what they've normally done in volleyball, and. Um, I don't know. Yeah, no, and I, I mean, I, I think uh, sort of like some of these um, newer cities that have come online, I mean, they've they've always had a fair, um, sizable sort of um, Chinese or Asian um, population, right? And some of these newer cities like Chicago, Ottawa, Calgary, I mean, they do have Chinatowns, right? I, I, I just think it's... The, the sport itself is probably there's a there's more of an awareness and there's been a bunch of things that have helped to increase the awareness I think Ursula's documentary in 2014 right. really did um, you know a boon um, for for the sport itself and it really sort of like highlighted why this is so important for yeah. for us as a sort of like a something that's ours as, as, a, as a cultural yeah. sport. And, and it didn't even, it only touched on some of the stories oh, available. Yeah. It would just yeah. scratch the surface. There is yeah. so much more involved. It's a very rich history and, to uh, it. Yeah. yeah, behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and there's a ton of characters and storylines that could go well beyond whatever Nine Men, the documentary, actually put forth. But uh, that is uh, one of our uh, crowning achievements, actually, right? It does put our sport a little bit on the map for the non-Asian community. I mean, I've had lots of people come up to me and say, oh, geez, I just saw that Nine Man documentary. And um, if for nothing else, if it just brought them into this world, then that that's kind of a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. So let's talk about the circuit. Um, so first of all, why is Labor Day the weekend? Like, th this is tradition that it's always going to be Labor Day, right? And then... It's up to seven teams now, or what were the original six seven on the cities? Circuit? Or excuse uh, me, yeah. yeah. Let's raise so, them out here. <laughs> uh, right, uh, the current uh, list of cities, and I'll try to. Or maybe if you want to explain Labor Day while we're counting. So okay, our Labor Day. Here. So um, uh, if we go back to historically how the tournament came into being, um, so uh, the tournament basically uh, started with friends or families members who lived in different North American cities. So we're talking in the 1940s and uh, where um, immigration maybe wasn't as free flowing as it was as it is now. And uh, you'd have very, very small Chinese communities and people who were immigrating out of China or out of Hong Kong basically were trying to get to North America and anywhere they could. So you'd have them set up in cities such as San Francisco, uh, Boston, uh, New York, and um, they wouldn't come with their families. They'd come by themselves. So maybe their brother or their cousin or wherever, they would have to immigrate to a different city. So the only way for these people to actually get together as a family was during weekends or holidays. Um, and traveling around from city to city back then was, was not something easy to do. Uh, first of all, you can't even get the weekends off to do it. So really, family gatherings, just as it is today, Family gatherings only always revolve around holidays. Um, so as 
and I'm not sure exactly how this came to being, but one of the sports they played back then in China uh, was volleyball. And uh, 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 nine man is just another way to have more people involved at the game. So they brought that here. Uh, they decided uh, to play uh, and congregate together uh, as a family or as people from their own villages from China or from with other family members or uh, uh, from the old country. And Labor Day was the day they started doing this as an annual uh, uh, event and gathering. Um, uh, I was not around to that, but uh, I have other people from Flying Tigers that could probably uh, uh, bring more rich um, description to that uh, culture. But um, um, back then in North America, only certain pockets of immigration from China were happening too. It, was, it wasn't like people from all over China. It was from a specific province, um, Guangdong, Toisan, uh, that most of the immigration into North America was from that province in China. Which you've got family from, and which, I have family. Which we both have family origins yep. from, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, and uh, there's a big community still with that. Uh, and they were the first immigrants, more or less, that, uh, I don't want to say built the railroads, but uh, those were the people that led from the railroads mm -hmm. to the early 30s, early 40s, where there was head tax and all that for those people to come in. Those were the uh, people that began the immigration sort of invasion into North America. So this was one of the events that kept them together. Now, um, yeah, I, I don't have any more stories. That was way past my time. Uh, but uh, historically, I'm sure we, I've seen documentaries actually that kind of uh, explain that whole cycle of um, and pattern of uh, migration, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm sure parts of that uh, have heavily influenced um, uh, what happens on Labor Day. And um, it just, spawned from there. I mean, it just became bigger. I mean, more and more families participate. I mean, I myself am a family that participates in this tournament. There are other cities that have generations of players and families like grandfather, father to grandson or granddaughter that, that participate in this tournament. Uh, we've just carried on the legacy of, uh, of, of players and from that time to this time. So just to give our listeners a scope, um, is this the 75th? This is number 75, yeah, this year in Toronto. So the circuits, it's got some, some mileage, eh? It uh, goes back a long time. I think there was a claim to fame that we didn't even stop for the World Wars. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how... That might be a rumor. Yeah. We need to fact check that one. Right. <laughs> right. Intern Jim, you're on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, right now, so the uh, cities, uh, in I don't know if this is the correct order or not, uh, but uh, last year... Uh, this year will be in Toronto. Next year is in Washington. The year after that will be Boston, uh, followed by San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, and then back to Montreal, which we were at last year. And uh, that is uh, the seven city cycle. Uh, every year we move and go to a different city to host this tournament. Um, we uh, originally actually had a six city I'm sure at the very beginning there was only three or four cities, but for about a good 30 years there was a six-city circuit. Mm -hmm. uh, Los Angeles is probably the most recent city to join the circuit, and they've probably done it two cycles now as host city. So uh, we have a good, uh, I mean, these are all the major metropolitan cities in North America, short of Chicago or Philadelphia maybe. But uh, this is the these are the cities that have the largest Chinese population, um, and not to mention they just have the largest populations of the cities in general or in, in North America. I mean, Toronto is just huge, right? Uh, mm -hmm. As far as a major Canadian city. So good. Let's cover, anyone who listened to Wesley's episode, we did cover content, but can you just describe um, that rule? So obviously Chinese makes up two thirds in both the men's and women's games. So the men, they play nines. So it'd be six of the nine need to be Chinese descent and the women would be four of six, I guess, to be the two thirds rule, right? Correct. There is a rule uh, stipulated in our nine man, official nine man rule book where two thirds of the players on the court have to be 100% of Chinese descent. Um, and the other one third can be from, uh, their, their ethnicity can be from one of a group of countries that we've defined in the rule book and that we'll have to look up. But, uh, I forget how many number of cities, but it's mostly East Asian countries involved in those uh, uh, in that list, and that one third of players 
have to have an ethnicity that belonging of those countries you know, or origin of those countries. And, and just for our listeners who are kind of getting their backup going, whoa, 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 that's kind of exclusive. Why are we doing this again? Wesley kind of covered this where he mentioned when people first moved here, they weren't even welcome in YMCA's and playing in other sports or they, they weren't really included. So basically they, this circuit started because like, again, the sense of community, the sense of family. So right. it, it's not that I, I can play nine man if I want. I'm just not on this circuit. This circuit Correct. has participation rules the same way that the AVP in the States, you have to be American. So there mm-hmm. are like, there's rules for every league almost that like, yep. there's certain criteria. This just happens to be a criteria on heritage. Is that Ooh. fair to say? Uh, I, that's absolutely fair to say. I mean, um, there are, th- this really borders on a lot of um, politically pol- political correctness, for sure. And we don't dance around that, right? And um, I, like to, I like to say it, and, and I think I mentioned words to this effect at last year's captain's meeting. We're trying to actually, uh, not exclude, but we're actually trying to promote uh, our culture in a lot of ways. I mean, uh, uh, you're exactly right when you said, Josh. Uh, I mean, back then, it was very difficult. Uh, as an immigrant, I mean, even now, immigrants really have it so hard just to succeed in the society, right? And even back then, I remember this one scene from, uh, I don't know if you guys ever saw this movie. It was the Bruce Lee movie where um, Jason Lee is Bruce Lee and Lauren Holly is his wife, Linda. And uh, there's a scene where in the movie theater that they're watching uh, my, uh, Breakfast with Tiffany's, I think. They had an Asian character there that was the landlord that was kind of uh, going through all these Chinese, Japanese um, sort of idiosyncrasies and uh, um, and sort of biased, you know, your, your t- typical Asian stereotypes. And um, in the movie, you see everybody laughing at uh, this actor playing the Asian character with the uh, bad accent and acting, uh, you know, not like anyone would North America normally would. And everyone in the theater was laughing at that. And you could see Jason Lee as Bruce Lee uh, not laughing. And uh, this is how it was back then. I mean, we all grew up in different times and tolerant uh, um, times. And hopefully we're growing more as a people in general uh, from that. But back then, being laughed at for that was common. Right, and uh, when that happens, you have no other choice but to fall back on your own community because you don't get ridiculed for things like that. Right, you are accepted as normal, as who you are, as a people, as a culture. So obviously, you congregate towards that kind of environment because it's a positive environment. It's one that's not negative. It's one that's not insulting, and this is why groups actually get together. So for me to say, uh, we're you know, we're exclusive, we don't let people participate. Well, maybe that's indirectly what happens, but I'm trying to foster an environment where people can come that are 100% Chinese or even partial Chinese or even Asian. They can come and feel uh, like they, they belong. We're here to celebrate our culture. We're here to support uh, 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 our sport here. And we're here as a family and as a community to enjoy our time together uh, and through the medium of, uh, of, of volleyball. I mean, I don't know. What's a, a better way to uh, say I think that's that. very well said. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but uh, that's how I feel about it. And sure, there's rules that don't allow people to play. So sorry, Josh Nickel, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, we'll figure out a way to somehow get you uh, on the court somehow. But uh, well, in speaking yeah. to some Nung Lam friends, I heard in DC this year they had an open content tournament where they piloted it where like people who were, weren't belonging of these Chinese descent or the countries you listed there that uh, they were allowed to play this year in, in a mini. I think they it was. absolutely did that, and this is uh, this is just something else that's really good for the community. And uh, obviously, since we all play volleyball, we all play with uh, uh, not just. Asian people, we all play volleyball with anybody who, who we like, and they're from all sorts of cultures. So obviously, the people you want to play volleyball with, they're interested in what you do as a volley- in volleyball, and if they hear you play nine men and have all this fun, obviously, they'll want to be to get in, in, in on it somehow, too. So in D.C. this year, they had the D.C. Mini, which was just two weeks ago, and they um, didn't uh, use the uh, content rule at all for any of the teams. Uh, and it was pretty much an open tournament, uh, and um, it, it's quite successful. Actually, I think they split it off uh, as well. There was an A side and a B side, 
as far as tier is concerned. But uh, it wasn't open. It was definitely an open tournament. I, I was very successful. I mean, lots of people had fun, and kind of how how can you argue against that? I yeah, suppose, right? I mean, I, I think it's a. I mean, we're talking about the Labor Day tournament or the major or the nationals right now, but. I think the thing that we also have to recognize, too, is that with all of these cities here, in addition to some of the other newer cities, there are a lot of these local tournaments that are being held, and there's many different ways that you can experiment with different formats, ethnicity rules, um, that allow, I think, for the sport to be brought into more of a, more of a, more access to mainstream, if, if that's, I think, the, the, the way to put it, than, than being so strict, um, with the content rules, uh, you know, during during this particular tournament. But, I mean, this is something that we debate year after year is, you know, how do we open it up uh, to to everyone? How do we expose it to mainstream? How do we get new players into the game? But at the same time, to what I've been said earlier, it's, you know, this, this game was created um, out, of a, out of a sense of community, um, belonging, and, and culture, and we want to be able to ensure that we're, we preserve some of that, so that rich history um, is not lost. Good, thank you. Well said. Um, so let's let's get into that. You mentioned that there are other tournaments. So for some of our listeners thinking like, oh, you guys just play on Labor Day, but no, people dedicate their whole summer to this, right? So let's kind of go over the schedule and what is available. Because when I was with Nung Lam, uh, Canada Day was obviously a big one. Yep. We always enjoyed going to the New York Mini and then the Major. Like those were our big three, and then we'd obviously go to Night It Up or Phoenix host a tournament or Tigers or. It seems like there, there are a lot of events, so can you kind of explain what is available, what, it, what does it take to run a mini, um, what are some of your favorites? Like, let's go over the whole kind of season, because you can commit a full summer, like I said, to the Right, sport. I mean, um, our, our sport really is a summer-only sport. I mean, San Francisco does run a, an October 10th tournament, but for the most part, um, everyone goes back to school in the off-season, and they do their six-man volleyball club seasons and nine man really is for all intents and purposes a summer sort of sport so we don't go all year round and it's really just the i mean summers for high school students is really just two months it's really short and um, for university students it's like four months and it's not even that's not even that much longer but uh, it's a very short season um every and because it's a short season and because there's travel involved at labor day i mean everyone's expected to sort of travel to a different city um not everyone has the expense uh, and bank account to uh, uh, afford multiple trips uh, just to play volleyball. I mean, people have families, they want to go on family vacations, or they have bills to pay, or mortgages, or tuition to pay. So traveling is not a luxury that our community can afford to do on a regular basis. So that spawns the minis. Now, every city, I would say every city now, has their own version of a mini, which really the majority of the uh, 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 registered teams are the local teams. So we have a Canada Day tournament that's gone on for decades now. Uh, we always try to host it around uh, Ju uh, July the 1st in celebration of our nation's uh, 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 birth date. Um, uh, it's never usually right on that, uh, that day, but it's always on the weekend uh, in or around that date. And uh, all the local teams, including Montreal and Ottawa, participate in this tournament for us on Canada Day. So it's entirely almost 100% Canadian content, but we'll have some special guests. Uh, two years, uh, last year, we uh, Chicago came to participate. Um, when uh, Boston Knights came maybe 20 years ago. <laughs> but uh, there's there's always interest, and it just it's a matter of timing for other teams to New come York to. Mason. New York Freemason, or, actually yeah, on the yeah, women's yeah. side, yeah. comes every year for the past five years. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I, uh, we have great friends on that team who make an effort to come participate in this tournament. They do have some Toronto content on that team, which makes it easier for them. But uh, 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 Boston Rising Tide came to the Tigers tournament two years mm -hmm. ago, I believe, and, uh, and another New York team came. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for Canada Day, it's the majority of the, the uh, participants are the local Canadian teams. For sure. Do you remember how many teams were played in Canada Day this year? This year we had 65, all uh, men's and women's. I think it was 35 and 30. It was definitely over 35 50. women's and 30 men's, I mm -hmm. think. And what would be some of the, I, I don't know how to say this, a, a bigger mini? Like how many teams would maybe be in New York? Or so what's some of the bigger circuits? New York, the New York mini, which is uh, a 
around the third week of July, is the largest mini on the East Coast, probably on the West Coast too, and um, they had uh, 105 teams, I believe, men's and women's, and the reason why New York can attract that number of teams, number one, because it's New York City, everyone loves to go to New York City, uh, but number two, geographically, New York is the cent almost the center's most city from all these other uh, participating cities. Um, it's it's eight hours from Toronto Drive, uh, directly east, and from Boston to New York, which is kind of southwest. It's a six-hour drive from Washington, which is coming up north to get to New York. It's eight hour. I, I, I can't remember exactly. It's like an eight-hour drive too. And to from, New York? Yeah. From here? From Washington. Oh, from Washington, yeah. 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 And from Montreal, it's like a six-hour, five-hour drive. So it's geographically benefits all these cities, and that's why it's able to attract that many teams. And it's, a, it's a Danny Moy down there runs a, a good tournament. And um, it's another opportunity for all, all of us to get together, and it's kind of a warm-up tournament to the major, really, uh, to see where teams are at, uh, and uh, it's a good trip. And... Um, yeah, and I feel like I feel like New York almost embraces like the grittiness of the game. Yeah, just like how it's that's be, an excellent of, point because of the um, it's held in Seton Park. If right. that's where it's still held, it's like it is embedded literally right in the heart of Chinatown, where you have a mix of the new generation with the old generation, with people who have just immigrated here, and you have all of these. You know these people that are just walking through the park that are watching this, you know, massive volleyball tournament kind of unfolding, and and they don't know what they're seeing, but they love it. And you know, it's um, and it, and because New York is um is is edgy, like I feel like, it, and we were talking about this before, it is one of my favorite tournaments because it does have that sort of yeah. like unpolished You're feel to it with like a really high level of competition and the intensity that like I find really interesting about this sport right whereas i feel like some i mean we're here at the convention center it's almost like a professional setup here yeah so with some of the traditional elements that we used to play with the sun right the concrete you know and and the external elements um that, i feel like new york really really embodies yeah all that. that's a hundred percent correct i mean um, because our because this sport has grown to the size that it, it has it's really difficult now to have an outdoor, an all outdoor tournament. Um, and New York is one, the New York Mini is one of the few that consistently happens outdoors. And during that weekend in the summer, there's still a chance of rain, but uh, we're all accepting of that, just so we know that we can play outdoors. And the entire Chinatown community knows it happens in New York. Uh, you have old uh, uh, people, you have young people show up. They all huddle around, uh, this big gated fence area. I mean, it's not locked or anything. But uh, if you just if you see movies of, of uh, basketball players uh, playing outdoors, and it's it's everyone as spectators just is around the fence on the outside of the court. This is the exact same thing that happens in New York. You have um, uh, just the groans from the crowd, this that, and it's just a lively lively atmosphere. Um, other tournaments, it's really just actually the players who are the spectators. But in New York, you have spectators there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you have people that don't play, that are watching intently, too. Um, yeah, it's not yeah I feel like for me, people. being kind of an outsider, that was probably my first real experience. Because like you said, it's in Chinatown, it's yeah. outside, it's hot in New York. Right. Uh, we made semis and finals there, and it's four, five, six people deep around your yeah. court. and. They're kind of bumping me out of the way because they want to see. Right. Like, yeah. um, it's a little random, that's for sure. But and like like you said, there's fans there. But I also noticed the New York culture, when you get eliminated, you don't leave either. Like everyone sticks around to watch like the, the finals, even yeah. if you're not in it or if you don't know people, right? So it just seemed like a really cool community sense that... I uh, think people invest in it, right? Yeah. They invest not... Well, they've invested their time into to watch and they want to see how it ends. But they've kind of invested emotionally into it a little bit. Just a tad. Right? And, and I think too, like, I mean... The, the friendships that are developed by just the years that you're involved with this. I mean, I mean, you have friends all across North America, and every single year we have this tournament. It's like, it's like you're picking up, 
you know, where you left off last year, and you see these people that you literally have been seeing for decades at those tournaments. I mean, these are these are real friendships, and just right. like I've developed or I've formed a lot of friendships across North America. So, you know, when the people, when we say other spectators, or when people get knocked out of tournaments, they will stay. They stay because they want to see their friends play because yep. they've made friends from you know other teams that live in other cities. You know, there's a real friendship component yeah, there, to this, right? And it's not just, you know, people that are rooting specifically for their teams, but they're rooting because they have friends that are on other teams that are located in other right. cities. Yeah. Right? Um, I have met wonderful people mm-hmm. through this tournament. Well, that's, why, that's why we still do this. People. This is just a lot of the reason why. Josh Nickel, you and I, I met you through this tournament. This. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Uh, I, I consider you a friend. I mean, well, thank you. Yeah. And that's, if for nothing else, if that's the only thing that I get out of this tournament, uh, as opposed to winning or learning anything about volleyball, I've established great friendships. No mm-hmm. question about that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. um, now look at look at our look at who's helping us out this weekend. And again, this is and, purely yeah. volunteer. We don't pay anybody. Yeah. It's oftentimes a very thankless job, but we have a ton of friends, and so we're super thankful that yeah. we have this amazing committee and crew that are, for example, Will, William Fang, who's coming in at 4 o'clock in the morning basically to put tape down to mark off all the courts, right? I mean, this guy's not getting paid yeah. at all, but and, he's, and he's just, doing it because yeah. this is part of community exactly. building. And, and just so your listeners don't know this, Josh Nickel was setting up nets for mm-hmm. us at this tournament in Montreal at 2.30 in the morning last year. <laughs> so, lots of people... <laughs> I wasn't alone, though. It was kind of a a cool (laughs) sense where, like you said, like tomorrow when you guys need to set up over 30 courts, every Toronto club is going to send people and everybody's going to chip in. Tomorrow, everyone is helping. We try to make everybody be a part of it. I mean, it's not forced labor, but it kind of is. Right, just like Josh and Edmund's son, Brendan, who's kind of (laughs) hanging out in the corner right now. (laughs) It's just, it's past midnight, but... You guys are helping us unload a bunch of equipment into this room that we're sitting in right now. Right, yeah, podcast. I mean, so, there's lots of good people yeah. in this tournament. Yeah. I mean, that's what makes it go. I mean, we're just fortunate. To, yeah, I'm really fortunate oh, to have I, met all these people. I mean, you, you're not just friends. You're part of, at least for me, you're part of my extended family. Like, I mean, I don't know if I ever said that to you guys, but you, you guys are part of my extended family. And that's how I like to treat this ass, uh, as, as anyone who comes into my life. I mean, uh, this is a community the community is based on family, and um, that's how I like to uh, continue on with uh, how I perceive things as. Mm-hmm. Nice. Very cool. Um, I'd like to draw on your experience, kind of what we've seen change. I, I know we covered the size of the event. Like you said, it has to be in an indoor venue, basically. But um, I, I love New York. I've heard good things where when Washington hosted one cycle, like it was on a major street, like it was outside. Like, What are some of the cooler venues you guys have seen? That What's was, kind of the history yeah. of... Some of the better venues that you've seen where, yeah, now we use convention centers, it's on sport court, but yeah. can you guys just draw on your personal experience, either a mini or a major, where it's kind of like, this is this is pretty cool just to take in like the environment we're in right now. Yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't playing that year where, in Washington, yeah. you guys were literally playing just outside the White House. We were playing on Pennsylvania right? Avenue, right. Wow. overlooking Congress that way, and monument that way and the white house down the just street the courts went down the road like just went down the road it was uh it was really unbelievable in a lot of ways i mean from a security yeah. point of view it's like i can't believe we're actually here i mean hopefully we don't get shot right um <laughs> but um it was it was a security nightmare for the washington uh, team that that ran it and mm-hmm. i to a man i don't think they they'd like to do that again or they'd like to try to do that again i don't know but uh, for sure, it was definitely um, um, nothing that happens regularly, for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, right now, we, we're almost spoiled. We go indoor. Uh, we set up uh, the sport court. Um, you know, the washrooms are over there. There's no sun in your eye. Um, you know, it's a nice climate-controlled, air-conditioned environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, anytime it goes outdoors, it's for me, since I'm a, I'm a little old school on that, it... Uh, it's it's really special actually. And yeah, actually, Washington one of the is. one of the really cool years too was when we had it. Oh, and I, I keep mixing up the years. Maybe it was uh, ninety eight, no, two thousand when we had it 
in Toronto. It was at the Canadian National oh, at the X, or yeah. the CNE. Yeah. So we literally were just beyond the for for your listeners that are in Toronto, you'll know the CNE and just sort of the area that's beyond the Princess Gates. But there was one year where we had the tournament in the middle of the CNE grounds, just beyond the Princess Gates, and you can imagine just like the ensuing chaos of people just like hitting balls and it like knocking you know someone who was standing in line to get a corn dog um and then like you know just like balls being lost because they were just like you know being uh being passed around everywhere um but just sort of like being in that carnival festival atmosphere and and quite frankly it was like the exposure that we got for people who didn't normally know what Nyman was because that's not necessarily an audience or a crowd that we would normally draw yeah. um, uh, attention to, which was really neat. And then the other memorable, memorable thing about that tournament was that it started to rain, and so then we had to move into the armory by Fort York, which was quite an ordeal in and of itself, that we had to pick up all of our courts overnight, move to a facility that was a couple of miles away just so that we could continue to play. Yeah, the rain out uh, really... Affected really the schedule spoiled. in the bad kind of way, yeah. but um, that's the gamble you kind of take when you organize a uh, an outdoor tournament in uh, September, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. There's another cool. Do you remember the year in Boston when we played in the castle? So it was oh, another, yeah. There was another raining situation as well. Right. Uh, that was a couple. That was uh, no, I think like twice it happened in the, the yeah in the while while I was a player. The well, we called it the Kumite. I don't know. <laughs> Back then. So, is that a Karate Kid thing? It sounds like it's a Karate Kid uh, thing. There's a movie. Are we allowed to openly quote movies? Oh, absolutely. Movies? Yeah. All right. So there was a movie back then in the 90s, 80s. Uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme was called Bloodsport. Bloodsport. And Kumite was the arena. This was before UFC was even in. Yeah. It sounds right? very violent. But uh, it was. It was, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they called it the, they called the octagon at the time where the mat, where the you know, fought the Kumite, right? right, right. And did he do the, the splits? Mm, well, I'm sure, I guarantee yeah. at some point during that movie he did So, splits. yeah, I'm sure he did. <laughs> but the reason why we called it the Kumite is because there was kind of like, um, not festival seating, but there was an upper uh, balcony where you couldn't watch on the ground, uh, spectate from the, f- the floor because it was just wasn't enough room. So you would go, this was like a castle. You'd have to go up to the upper balcony and the noise that gets projected mm-hmm is like echoing and I it's, mean, it's the acoustics of a castle yeah but but there was carpet in the castle and there was which carpet even which bounces off so weird the every and everyone cheers yeah. quite loudly there's nine guys in the court in the men's game right so when everyone cheers together it's quite loud now that you have applause from the gallery and that's why we call it the cumulative because like <laughs> i don't know if you remember the fight scenes but you'd have the crowd chanting Chong Lee, Chong Lee, or whatever it was that, uh, or, and um, so that's why we call it that. Now, no one really understands that reference, and whenever I bring it up, no one really understands what I'm talking about. But, um, <laughs> but that's what uh, that's what we called. I forget what the name of the castle was, but it was know. it was right next we'll to the hotel. To, actually, we'll have to get intern Jim. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> to, to look it up. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what were we were talking about. We were just talking about like cool venues that mm-hmm. the, the tournaments. Yeah, were the X like. was a uh, the X mm-hmm. got both negative and positive sort of reviews, but it's almost like you it's almost want it to be negative. Not negative. You don't, you don't want it to be negative. Unique. You want it to be no. unique, and you want it to be different, and you want it to stand out, and that's what yeah. that it did. I feel yeah. like if we could do around two of it, yeah. there are a lot of things that we learned. Yeah, that we could we could probably and and again I mean like. OVA finals are held at the Anor Care Center, yeah. right? Which is on the CME grounds anyway, but that's indoor. I think mm-hmm. I think if we did sort of like an outdoor version of the tournament now, uh, outside of the CME, I mean, there's probably a few things that we that we learned that we could probably do better. Um, I don't know if we'll ever go back to the X uh, anytime soon. There's a dollar figure that I'm not sure if we're prepared to. Uh, and it's from a security point of view, like even yeah. in Washington... Um, the security budget around that just kind of destroyed the whole concept of uh, fiscal responsibility, I think, in Washington mm-hmm. for that year. Yeah. And uh, the X for us would be a security, a um, mm-hmm. little bit of a nightmare, too. There's no real areas for it. But, uh, 
it is unique, and I think we're at the stage of our tournaments that uh, uniqueness is good. I mean, like I said, we're, we're almost a little bit spoiled for going indoors all the time, and, and uh, you know, it just becomes a, a volleyball tournament, which is unfortunate because we actually are more than just a volleyball tournament, right? Right, and we've been lucky, like you mentioned, like to get the OVA to give Sport Court or some of these convention centers, or when we were in Anaheim, I believe that's like USA Volleyball's training facility. Yep, the yep. Venue we that, was, that was cool too. I yeah. 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 So I, I think a lot of people with the tradition want to be outside and they want to feel it, but I think there there are some opportunities to kind of to go inside seems like the, the smart thing to do because you can't risk it with weather and all the other conditions. But has there ever been a, a year with a major where you had to modify the format, or is every year where a winner wasn't crowned because you well, just couldn't do it? Well, there was a year where, when my team was involved in the finals, mm-hmm. we uh, we didn't play it out, and we kind of forfeited Did you lose the finals. The coin toss? Well, we didn't even get to yeah. that. It was a little bit of a. It didn't end well. So there, there was a year where my team kind of. Same thing. Yeah, same thing. So um, obviously, I mean, it's up to the discretion of the host city or host committee at that time to. Shorten the games as as they see fit uh, for the benefit of either sponsors wanting to go to the dinner or that, that they don't have the uh, the facility past a certain hour or whatever it was or what is it what what major football game did they interrupt for Heidi or whatever that was I mean I don't know if you so they, what are you talking about this is like in the sixties I think they interrupted a major football game for, for because this movie called Heidi or something like that was supposed to start at seven o'clock, and you know how games they run. Oh, okay. so back that get the intern on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so but it, what happened was is one of the greatest comebacks in football, right? That nobody saw. That nobody oh, saw because that was so, televised because Heidi. The because movie this movie is it was seven o'clock, and you had to show. Yeah, right? I mean yeah. because it's people. Full of fun facts. That's yeah, fun yeah, that was a that's a funny one, but it, um, uh, but yeah. Um, for the past few years, I mean, it's been pretty good on the schedule. I mean, most of the time we start the finals mm-hmm. at around 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things, too. Like, if we know that the day is running later on the last day, right. we'll do a few things to accelerate the schedule, perhaps in the morning or the early afternoon, so we can get to a true final, i.e. 3 out of 5 or 2 out of 3 or whatever, whatever format. Um, or just we want to make sure that there's a full game that's played for the for the final. Um yeah, it's just, it's unfortunate when sometimes you just like you crown a winner by coin toss, and we've we've had a few situations where we've yeah. had to do that before. Unfortunately. That's unfortunate. Yeah, um, it's fortunate and unfortunate because um, obviously we we all play to win, right? I mean, but we're more than just the sport too. Yeah. So yeah. I can I can relate on both sides of that. Yeah. I'm not gonna. I mean, I can argue for both. Yeah. But you don't want to say that you won because. You picked definitely heads. not. Yeah, yeah, definitely not. Or lost because you picked heads or tails. Right. Um, I mean, that's not. Yeah, that, it is what it is in that mm-hmm. situation. Yeah. All right, guys. I, I think I've taken enough of your time mentioning that you know people are going to be on site as early as four in the morning to set up for this thing. So uh, <sighs> yeah. you might have to be our, our very first returning guest, and we can always just go down the wormhole yeah, and tell yeah, some more yeah, stories. But returning guest. Not <laughs> yet. Point, not yet. We've only existed since April, so you know we got oh, okay. we got to cover everybody first before we do a live. Right. Right. So, okay. Know. But no, this was good. I, I feel like we we've built on what Wesley talked about, and we we talked about some new stuff, and really. I think this really takes a snapshot of what Nine Man is about in the, in the community and all the good stuff. And if we left it. anything out, you guys can always just come back on. Well, thank you very much yeah, for having us, Josh. Josh. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was awesome to talk to you about this. So for anyone in the GTA, they can come down to the Toronto Metro Convention Center. Is that the proper Metro center? Toronto Convention thank Center. Uh, Saturday, August the 31st to Monday, September the 2nd. Be matches going on from eight o'clock till six o'clock on every day. Um, we might wrap up a little bit earlier on the Monday, but for the most part, we're starting eight o'clock in the morning. Matches all day, and even if you've never seen it, honestly, just pick a court, start watching. And if you have questions, just honestly ask the person beside you. I've never met a rude person in Nine Man who's not going to like share information. Yeah, I'm or sure there are, but off, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. But I, I haven't ran into them, so yeah. Even if you've never seen it, feel free to, to come down and, and check it out. And I think this is gonna this is a good weekend to do it. Fast matches, high intensity. It's it's a good time. If you've never seen it, this is probably the best time to do it. So, yeah. we won't be back for another seven years. So you can't put it off if you're looking <laughs> to catch it the next time it comes around. So awesome! Right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. <laughs>